It is pretty wild to think that like, like he threatened North Korea with nuclear war on Twitter. Hands off that dial. Business is about to get a whole lot nerdier. You're tuned in to Founder Quest. Did you see that tweet that I posted in the channel or the TikTok video about the the shape? That was tour? so good. I laughed. So laughed good. Really hard. So so good. I I just love the voice of the person doing the shapes. Yeah. <laughs> and where do you think this one goes? <laughs> It's a shape sorting thing and they've got all different colored blocks like a kid's toy and uh, you're supposed to match the shape to the, the hole in the top of the bucket. But it turns out all of the shapes just fit inside a square hole. <laughs> and so... Much like software. This one, yeah, this, so this, it's a reaction video. This woman's watching it and she's just getting more and more dismayed as he just puts everything. She's like, no, put in the triangle hole. And, and it's like, no, no, it's this one goes in the square hole. <laughs> So I think this yeah. is a metaphor for like how users will use Excel for every single task in their business. <laughs> yeah. So I want to put the tweet in the, in the show notes, but that was funny that I found. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I like watching TikTok, but I'm like, I'm too old to actually watch TikTok. So I just watch like video compilations of TikTok that like somebody shows me. I watch TikTok yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> Same. Yeah, I watch TikTok on Twitter. Twitter, yeah. That's an interesting thing about TikTok is it's like, like half the people who enjoy the videos aren't even on the platform or are watching them. Like, cause I mean, they're everywhere. The they're all over Instagram. I guess. Yeah, it is. I just want to know like how much, how much of, so there's, there's gotta be a number out there, like the total traffic on the internet per day, like total bandwidth used. How much of that is just sending around videos and screenshots of other parts of the internet? Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess like the same thing happened with Vine. That's uh, you know, it's like marketing attribution, attribution, right? You, you never know where your traffic's coming from. Like TikTok, they have no idea where the video is actually being seen. <laughs> it's like, yeah. is it on TikTok? Is it on Twitter? Is it on Reddit? Who knows? It's got to well, be were pretty, for their for their engagement numbers. You know, they were pretty smart to put their their watermark on the on the videos. <laughs> totally. So you're about to tell us like how great you're feeling. I think. Yes, man. I'm so excited. Today it's been a great day so far. I mean, it's early, right? But, but what happened? Well, I, I finally, after many, many weeks of having this on my to-do list, I finally got it this week and this morning I finished off putting together everything required for the Heroku add-on for Hook Relay. Oh, nice. awesome. Yes. So Hook Relay is a product you've been working on that adds sort of like push button reliability to people's implementations of web, web hooks. Am I right? That's, that's correct. Did, it, did you pivot? We haven't pivoted yet. No. Okay, good. <laughs> and as I was writing up that, that Heroku stuff, so you have to, for Heroku, of course, you have to like put in a description of what your thing does and you have to upload some screenshots and you have to, you know, do pricing and all that stuff was basically done. But the last thing to do, the thing that I kept on putting off because like, it's just not my, my strong suit. And so, you know how that goes. You just do the things you like to do over the things you don't like to do. But the, the last thing was putting together the dev center documentation page. So each Heroku add-on needs to have some documentation at Heroku. You know, it tells you how to use the add-on and what, you know, that's how to provision it, things like that. It's pretty straightforward and simple, but like, I'm just not a big fan of writing stuff like that. And so anyway, I kept putting it off. And, uh, but bonus was like, Kevin had put a quick start page together for Hook Relay like months ago when we launched the product, which is basically like, here's how you use it, which is basically the same thing that Heroku wants for this page. So I copied and, you know, most of his stuff and just shifted a little bit. But the thing that kind of threw me this morning as I was finishing it off, there was a, there's a field on the Dev Center page. There's this big, you know, text blob where you put your documentation and that's fine. But there's a field above it and it says meta description. And I was like, what's well, supposed to go in there? I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, because there's, there's a separate spot for doing like your marketing blurb, like, okay, give us the one line description of your add on, right? That's someplace else. And so I'm like, so what is a meta description? I, I don't is know. Is it like for SEO? The meta tag? Uh, well, I'm not exactly sure. When I saved the content, the, like the big blob of text that will make up the page, it took the first line of the content and put that in the meta description. I'm like, okay, so. I'm thinking maybe this is a TLDR. So I tweaked that a little bit. And as I was speaking that, I came up with a tagline for Hook Relay that now I'm no marketing specialist. I'm no guru, 
I'm no copywriter yeah. either. You're just a guy on I'm a podcast. Pretty, we're we're going to workshop this real time. <laughs> but I'm, I'm pretty proud of what I came up with here. And ratings are going to go through the roof. <laughs> and so here's, here's the tagline. Kevin helped me tweak this a little bit at the end. It is, just send a post request and let Hook Relay handle the rest. And Kevin's suggestion was that rest should be all caps because of course. <sighs> of course. Yes. <laughs> APIs. That are REST, yeah. So, yeah, there yeah. you go. Then, yeah. There. But you know, the, the catch is that like post and delete requests cost extra. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pay more for those. Right. So, so there we go. So now I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Like Hook Relay is signed, sealed, and delivered. It should be on the Heroku Marketplace next week. So Ooh, well, exciting. by the time this drops, it should be, it should be there. Awesome. That's, that's, that's great. That's, yeah. Really exciting. And don't we like have a customer or something? We, we do. We actually have a paying customer. That's pretty exciting. That's amazing. So that's yeah. you know, pretty impressive considering we haven't really done any real marketing or advertising for it. I mean, I've talked about it on the podcast and I tweeted about it a few times, but it's been pretty quiet. We've done that on purpose. We're kind of laying low to do the gradual build up, you know, make sure things are working yeah. before we unleash it to the masses. But we didn't try to yeah, get a customer, a customer is the point. Yeah, we did. Yeah. 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 That's, that's how I would have liked that. Can get we, the first um, customer. <laughs> yeah, can we just like um, trademark the term like ninja launch? Ooh, like I'm that. sure that people have done this. So it's like, it's the kind of launch where you just like sneak up on people and they don't see you coming. Then you just suddenly jump out and you surprise them and um, convert them. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like it. But how is it different from the stealth launch? Like, I, I have to figure that out. Is it like the bootstrapper version of the stealth, the stealth launch? Because I feel like if you're a stealth launch, like you have to be like, you have to have a bunch of VC funding and like be secret, secretive for at least two years for a stealth launch. Maybe the ninja yeah, launch is like you bootstrap it and like, yeah, you like six, six months bootstrap it and, and then it's, or maybe a couple months even ship it. Yeah. I don't know. A stealth launch maybe is like, you know, that they're out there, but you don't know where they are or what they're yeah. doing. But it's like this way. It's like it's like you just have no idea anything's going on. Yeah, I I, I like the your idea there, the booty shopper versus the VC because when I think stealth launch, I think like stealth bomber just coming in and bombing <laughs> the crud out of something, right? But a ninja, like it's much more personal, right? Hook him up and yeah. kill you one on one, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um. <laughs> so it's about it's more about hand to hand combat. Than, exactly. Okay. It's the personal. Touch. Yeah, we don't really assault people. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually it's always feel like it's a honey badger. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I just feel like I have to, I don't know why. I just like, I imagine there's somebody out there who's taking us literally um, for every single thing we say. So I just like always want to add disclaimers. Then, then there's the cat launch and that's the cat launch. The cat launch. That's where you, that's where you like build a trebuchet and the whole internet gets pissed off at you. <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking more of that's where you, you go out to your, your kitchen in the morning to get some coffee and you step on a hairball. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And that's your SaaS product. <laughs> there it is, right? It's like, oh, wow, well, there's a thing. <laughs> that's kind of how we did Honey Badger, right? It's like air break was our hairball. <laughs> we just stepped on when we were trying to do something else. <laughs> well, good. I'm, I'm glad you're having a good day and that Hook Relay is doing well. What's the next step on that, do you think? That's an excellent question. So I was reviewing the competitive landscape again this week and realized, you know what, we should make some tweaks to our pricing. So now that we have our first paying customer, it's time to change all the pricing. So that's probably not going to be next week. So, be naturally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It took us like a year to do that for Honey Badger. So I'm glad that we're just getting that over with quickly. Right, right. I love that like this, this time though, it's like in reverse, it would, it might be in reverse because like we're, we're billing on like more usage or like, like rate right now. And we're thinking mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it would make more sense to build on something, some other mm -hmm. like vertical, yeah, whatever. And then also figure out where and how we want to really launch. Like, how are we going to talk to people about uh, hook relay? We've got to become the marketing experts. It kind of makes sense maybe to not build on rate. Like just because like, I imagine that a lot of the people who are, probably going to be interested in hook relay or people who are building like new things i don't know like i like maybe people are going to go and retrofit it to existing things but you know i can imagine it being really useful it's like okay you're building a new product you want all these features you don't have time to implement it yourself because you have a million things to do and so you're just going to bolt this on there and you know your traffic levels are like you're getting real value so you should pay for it but your traffic levels are going to be pretty low to begin with 
Yeah, the contrary view to that is like Amazon, right? They have generous free tiers on most of their services, if not mm-hmm. all, right? And so you can start out and get a lot of value for free. And then everything is like strictly uses based, aren't even tiers for the most part. So like you just, everything you do is a transactional fee. So we could go the other way and then go from what we have now, tiers of, of transaction levels to just straight old like per transaction or per 1000 or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of, lot of things to think about. I feel like Amazon can get away with like the, that free, the like giving away the, the farm. Like, like right. that's kind of their part of their model. Like. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you have the, the biggest infrastructure on the planet, you can afford yeah. it free, right? Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of Amazon, I'm wondering, um, there, there's that, that ruckus lately about the um, Elasticsearch licensing. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if that, if that affects us at all. Someone should explain that to me, by the way, because I haven't, I, I saw it in, I saw you talking about it in chat, but I didn't have time. Yeah. This could week you explain really, it, Ben? Because like uh, I, I assume you know more about it than I do. I could probably get it eighty percent right. Well, I'll probably get some of it wrong. But you know, a few years ago, Amazon released their Amazon Elasticsearch service, and it's important to note the name because Elastic, the company that is the sponsor of Elasticsearch, the product, has a trademark on Elasticsearch. And so, one of Elastic's complaints against Amazon and AWS is that they're using the trademark without permission. That's one thing. And that's a, kind of a big thing, in, in, in my opinion, like you're not supposed to be stopping other people's trademarks. But the thing about trademarks is like there's timing involved, right? And so I don't know exactly what the timing was that they're getting the trademark versus AWS actually using that name, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to get into that. Mm-hmm. But you also have to defend your trademark, right? And it's not exceptionally clear just how defending Elastic was back when Amazon launched this because the founder of Elastic, he's been talking about this on Twitter this week. And He's like, well, we just want to keep our heads down and focus on the product. I'm like, okay, but there are certain legal requirements, you know, to defend trademark, et cetera. Anyway, so the the reason what the thing that really triggered all this was that Elastic changed the license of Elasticsearch, the product, this week from the Apache license to a what some people consider a non open source license. Mm. Which is the um what's it called? The server side I can't remember what it's called. SSPL, I think. Basically, it's, it's a license, same thing that MongoDB did and, and Redis did, basically saying anybody can use us except for companies who want to just resell our product, like, by the way, Amazon. So yeah, that, that just threw a, a, a match into the tinderbox of Hacker News, right? And people are like up in arms about Elasticsearch or Elastic doing this to Elasticsearch and, and how it's so terrible and the internet's going to, you know, burn in flames because of this. And, you know, I mean, they, it's their product. They can choose to do whatever license they want, right? A lot of people yeah. are complaining about, well, you know, the contributors contributed with a certain understanding and now you're yanking the rug out from under them. It's like, well, you know, Elastic 7.10 is still a Apache licensed. It's still out there. And of course, surprising no one, AWS announced yesterday that they are going to fork Elasticsearch at version oh, okay. 7.10, gotcha. the last Apache licensed version, and they're going to have their own distribution. So I was wondering if they would do that because... Yeah. We are a customer of uh, <laughs> this AWS Elastic Elasticsearch service, and I just didn't want it to go away because we've. It's been so hard to get like a, a, a like a decent search thing that doesn't just like crash all the time. And this isn't this isn't like I'm not blaming you, Ben. I'm just saying like this is like a complicated thing, and it's like you finally found a system that doesn't take just a ton of work to um, keep alive. Right. And I was just didn't want them to take it away from us. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because, you know, Elastic is really complaining about AWS because Elastic is making money on their cloud version. Like that's, that's the whole point. And Mm -hmm. uh, they don't, you know, not necessarily make money on their open source version. And the thing is like, we've tried, okay, I should put a disclaimer. This is just one person's experience. Please don't sue us. But we tried the Elastic cloud service, comparing it to the AWS Elasticsearch service. And Frankly, the AWS service was better for us. Like it just worked better. Now it's it's a little bit behind. Like they don't they don't always have the most recent version. They don't have all the coolest latest features like Elastic Cloud does because well, I mean Elastic is the company that runs that. But yeah, it's been rock solid, and <laughs> I haven't had to babysit it like we've had other solutions in the past. Like you said, so yeah, yeah I'm totally glad to ha- let AWS handle that for us. And 
sorry, Elastic. I mean, you just got to compete, I guess. <laughs> What was Elastic's actually like actual end game with the license change? Do you think were they trying to get the big customers who were reselling their service to pay them like licensing fees or something to like use it, or were they just trying to like cut them off? Or I mean, they must have seen this coming to some, yeah. uh, you know? Yeah, I would I would guess they're angling for a partnership, some sort of revenue share. Yeah, uh, because that's I think that's what they're doing with Google Cloud and with Azure. Okay. That's what Redis has done with Google Cloud and Azure. I mean, I don't know the details, obviously, but they say the word partnership. And so I assume that means some sort of gotcha. revenue share. But who knows what, I mean, maybe it's a licensing fee. I, you know, I don't know. Right. But uh, I'm, I'm, guessing, wild. I'm guessing that was their goal. Like, well, let's get some revenue from AWS using our do, product. Do, was it, were they like targeting AWS specifically or was this just like more general? Like we really should get like our, you know, people to pay when they're going, going to rebuild or whatever. Well, they have they have put in place recently partnerships with Google and Azure. Okay, so Amazon's like the biggest. I mean, like, so it's basically yeah, there's no Amazon. one else really. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Who else are you going to care about? <laughs> right. Yeah, oh, okay. do you think that maybe you know this is a result of like talks breaking down with Amazon? Like, it seems like if you wanted to have a partnership, you would approach them before yeah. you did anything publicly. <laughs> that seems like a fair analysis. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. I can totally relate about the trademark issue. Like back to that, like, uh, as I said in our Slack, like if, if Amazon tomorrow released an AWS Honey Badger service, like I'd be a little cranky about that because we do have a trademark on Honey Badger. And so I, I would be pretty upset, I guess. But again, I don't know like when exactly they got that trademark and if they called up Amazon and say, Hey, by the way, this is bad, you know, yeah, they're complaining about it now, but that was like six years ago. So yeah. That's true. I may be I may be willing personally to, you know, consider licensing the the Honey Badger trades mark to Amazon, depending upon the yeah. you know, agreement come to. I just want to put that out there, you know, in case yeah. like, you know, JB's listening. <laughs> if it was just the yeah. trademark thing, like they could have just I mean, because they didn't they didn't like Elastic Cash is Redis r- under the hood, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So but they don't and, call it AWS Redis. Right. And, like, and that's the thing, like the AWS has been pretty good about that. Like their document database is MongoDB compatible, right? Yeah. It's, so it's, you know, <laughs> and then they have, they used solar. They have, I can't remember what it's called. It's like called cloud search or something, but that was based on solar. Right. And then they had, and like you mentioned, their last to cache is based on Redis and Memcached. And now they have a Cassandra compatible thing. I can't remember what it's called, but it's not, it's not called Cassandra. It's called something else, some yeah. key spaces or something. So yeah, I mean, like product Call after something product else. is, yeah. So I don't know. So it, it seems like maybe there wasn't a trademark issue when Amazon actually initially launched this because mm. you'd think that they would have done the same thing with this one they did with all their other services that don't use that name, right? Yeah, maybe they figured that Elastic, since it's just a word, you know, like Mongo isn't really that, or like Redis is yeah. like a very specific thing. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm. Got to be careful when you try to trademark because, yeah, generic stuff doesn't work. Yeah, I don't know. I read the legal briefings that Amazon did and the whole um, when their parlay par- parlor was trying to sue them. Mm-hmm. I think it's parlor. And I read Amazon's responses and just like, holy crap, I never want to be in a legal battle with Amazon because they were not joking around. Yeah, yeah. Like they were not taking prisoners. They just like <laughs> came and and just used a nuclear bomb against this little this little guy with a slingshot. For real. I mean, yeah, justifiably so. I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying that they shouldn't have, but maybe that's what Elastic figured. Like it's not there's no point in, you know, trying to go legal against AWS. And so we're just going to ignore it and try and build our business. And okay, that's a valid strategy, but then like you can't undo that. You can't remake that decision. Yeah, now there's later, like you know there's like a yeah. fork of your product in the world, like that's backed yeah. by the largest company. Yeah. So it's, and, it's interesting times. Like I should, I should disclose that I am a shareholder in Elastic and I am a shareholder in Amazon. So you know what? I hope they both win. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure this conversation is definitely going to influence one of their stock prices. <laughs> <laughs> ben, ben Curtis makes disparaging comments about, about Elastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been really interested, though, as I've been reading on this this past week, like thinking about, and we've talked about this before, like open source 
businesses or businesses that try to have an open source component, like how does it even going to work, right? Like Red Hat was a big success story. And it seems like since then, I mean, Mongo has been, I guess, somewhat successful, but like the whole notion of open core, I think is, in my humble opinion, it seems like it's not happening. Like mm. you, it, Elastic tried it before they had their cloud. They, they tried adding additional, uh, like, <laughs> amusingly enough, and I, I just so disagree with this approach, but they did it. Like the authentication piece was a sold add-on to Elastic. Mm. Like, if you want a username and password, you got to pay for that. It's like, what? <laughs> You know, <laughs> um, but but anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, it just seems like like open core mm, not happening. And then so I like, mean, I, I've got to I've got to throw out there like GitLab. GitLab seems to be doing okay. Yes, yes, but and that's where I was going next. It seems like the real solution that all these open source companies have landed upon is is hosted, right? Some sort of licensing, whether that's self hosted licensing mm. or it's a SaaS. And, and and that's why you see like Mongo and Redis and Elastic, and, you know, having these licenses that say you can't host us because we're hosting us. That's our business. You know, if you're <laughs> competing against the number one hosting provider in the world and your only business is that and they have like 50 other businesses because they have a huge product offering. Well, who's going to win in the long term? I don't know. Anyway, it's, yeah. I don't have the answers. It's just interesting, interesting thoughts. Yeah. And like just one thing that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but like one real advantage that AWS has is that, you know, if you mm. use their Elasticsearch service, it's like, well, you can use your, you can put it in your virtual private cloud. Like you can do all that. You can use all these networking tools that AWS provides. You can use all these extra services. You know, it's going to be in, you know, in the right data center so that transfer between the two things is fast because like you don't want your freaking like database on a diff in a different state than your main application. And it's just, I, I don't know, like that, that piece is so easy for just stuff if you stay inside the AWS ecosphere and then it's, it's just more work if you don't. Yeah. So true. true. Yeah. Like the authentication stuff is handled. Most of the stuff has IAM permissions that are baked in. Now, most of the companies like Mongo and Elastic, they do have, you can deploy to whatever region you want. So the, the latency is typically not a problem. But yeah, the VPC thing is definitely an issue. Like, and for us, for me in particular, like not having to get another vendor on the approved vendor list for our GDPR yeah. stuff. Oh, so nice. Like <laughs> dealing with compliance, like every year I have to review all of our vendors and make sure they're all doing the security thing. And like, you know, AWS is fine. Like, yeah, that's just a checkbox, right? But if you have some other vendor like Mongo, you have to like, okay, well, I have to justify them and I have to put them on my approved vendor list, et cetera, et cetera. So like if AWS has, AWS has a service, I'm going to use it. <laughs> so we're not going to be launching a database product anytime soon, I guess is the moral of the story. No, no there will not be a Honey Badger database. <laughs> Which one? Of, there's one of our competitors that like pivoted into a database. Yeah, it was Influx. That was, yeah, Influx. Right? They made Influx yeah. DB. Yeah, which I think yeah. that's worked out for them. Mm -hmm. They seem to be they doing well. Be. Yeah, they do. Yep. Despite my on again, off again, love hate affair with Influx as we've tried to use it a variety of times. But I think, you know, what I've learned over the years, like we've, you know, we've worked together a long time and we worked together back when Mongo in particular was pre 1.0 and we tried using it, you know, uh, I think what I've learned is don't use pre 1.0 software. <laughs> Yeah. Especially databases. Especially <laughs> databases. <laughs> yeah. You want your database yeah. to be like 10 years old. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So now would be the right time to, to go all in on Influx. <laughs> right. Oh my God. Has it been that long? Yeah. yeah not really? quite that it's long. Been... It's been, it's getting close. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's about oh my probably God. getting there. Honey Badger is going to be coming up yeah. on like 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Was it like a yeah, year or two? Year. Is it next year? Next yeah. This mm -hmm. is not, this will be nine. Yeah. It's yeah. 20, 2012. Right. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Been a long Ooh. road. That's wild. I just, you know, here's to like another 20 years because like I have no idea how I'm going to apply to jobs if I have to with like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I was just my own boss for like 15 years. Yeah. Like, how do you like, what kind of a reference is that? You can't give that to people. So, you know, we just got to, we just got to keep this train rolling. I don't know. You know, maybe we just go work for Stripe. They worked for Patrick McKenzie. 
you know oh yeah. there you go yeah. i don't know if i have that much ambition <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He's, he is a bit of an outlier. Like, That's true. I don't know. I like I'm Honey Badger's got me hooked pretty much at this point. Like, <laughs> you know, I I'm was just, I'm just hooked on that um, re- on that recurring revenue. <laughs> hooked on that recurring revenue. Yeah, <laughs> just, like um, not that I have any plans to do this, but I was like, you know, if I just had to like get a developer job, it's just like, what if I just like learned Java and just. <laughs> <laughs> just was like, I'm just going to put my 40 hours in to Java and I'm just going to make a ton of money and just not care at all about the work. Yeah. Wait, like, um, and it was, I like, I don't think I would do it, but for a second it was like, you know, that seems, that seems viable. <laughs> it's definitely a grass is greener kind of situation. I think, uh, if I were thinking the same thing, uh, instead of Java, because uh, I just I cannot buy Java for whatever reason, I think it would be .NET, and I think I would go find oh, a, go. a job at a bank. You know, like mm. there you go. Yeah, I just know Java Java devs make like tons of money if they're in the right field. So or if they're in the, in the right industry. Well, if you want to go old school, learn COBOL. Right, take over. From I, those, totally yeah, I totally would. I totally would. I would totally learn become COBOL. A mainframe programmer. Yeah, like that actually sounds like a lot of fun. I could see that. Yeah. I mean, like, I could see if if you wanted to do that, I could see it working out because there's got to be like plenty of people that are like looking to retire and there's no one to take their place. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. You know? Like, I wouldn't want to have any deadlines because like that would be incredibly stressful. <laughs> it's like there's this like 50 year old legacy application <laughs> written in COBOL and you've got to figure out how to like make a major change to it by next week. It's like, that would be hell and just impossible. But do they really make major changes to them though? That's the question. I don't know. Yeah. I guess like if tax laws change significantly, you might have to or something, but yeah, you'd you'd think most of it'd be like more maintenance work. Was it one of you guys that shared this COBOL on COGS? No. I assume it's a web and it's a rails inspired, but it's a web framework and it um, is in COBOL and there's a, there's a, uh, the, the site is run by it. So, wow. So there you go. Index.htm, all caps. Nice. I know. Nice. I know. They're not messing around. Oh, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I, I'm gonna, <laughs> You're welcome. I'm going to spend the rest of my day just looking at this website. Oh. <laughs> you are more than welcome. <laughs> so one, one other thing that's made this week just fantastic and call out to the idea of actually having goals. You know, we have, we have our weekly check-in that comes in from Basecamp every Monday morning. It's like, what are you going to do this week? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I try to be pretty vague in that because I'm like, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but recently I've been trying to be better about that, to be more specific and to actually come up with like, okay, there are three things that if I accomplish this week, I will be happy, right? It, even if like they are small things, if I get them done, I'll be happy. And so this week I had two things with a third bonus that I didn't share and I actually did all three. So I was pretty stinking excited. So one was the hook relay stuff, which I did wrapped up this morning. Two was doing a, uh, a test of our new Elasticsearch cluster using the scientist gem from GitHub. So basically it allows you to deploy your, your site with two different code branches. Uh, in our case, checking the performance of our existing Elasticsearch cluster versus the new Elasticsearch cluster. And so basically just runs through both branches of code and then tells you which one is faster. So I did that. And then, spoiler alert, the the new cluster is faster. And also wanted to move our storage of notices from Postgres to DynamoDB. And I got that started last night. I mean, it's going to take a while to. Oh, to I was going to be like, it, Ben, you, you are, you, that's, that's shipped. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I was just, yeah. That's I was just like, you're just going to have to slide that one in. <laughs> and I that, finished up the branch and merged <laughs> it. <laughs> just migrated to a completely different database system for, <laughs> for like the most intense part of our application. Yeah. I just all, overnight just migrated those terabytes of data. It's like, good. Right. <laughs> so, but you got to, you got to start on it at least. Yes. Yeah. Nice. So I felt so good because like the things I set forth to do this week actually got done. So like I'm I'm just I'm pumped. So yeah. Good. There was a tweet that um, I was thinking about sending you last night, but I was too tired. So, uh, but I'll, so I'll just explain <laughs> it to you. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it was a guy quote tweeting an old tweet from like 2018 or something. 
And it was like, do yourself a favor. If you're making a SaaS product, users and accounts should be separate from the very beginning. And um, it was a quote treat Saw yesterday yeah. where, yeah, where the guy was just like, I just finished the refactoring that was a result oh, of, of yeah. yeah, two of years. This, that know, sounds just yeah, like us. Was, yeah. I replied to that tweet. I'm like, yep. Amen. Here's our blog post about doing the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. We took longer than two years though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I saw that tweet. So that's pretty funny. Yeah. I don't even know how many years I had that as a goal, but yeah, that was one of the banner things of 2020 actually like, Hey, got that done. Yeah. We forgot to mention that in the last, or we yeah. you know, remember that that was a big chunk of work. Yeah. So yeah. save yourself a lot of hassle, make users separate from accounts, period. The end, no question about it. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to figure out what episode number that was that we, we did like an entire episode on that, like mm -hmm. late last year, I think. Well, well, y'all have done some fantastic work this week too, right? I mean, Star, you've been nailing the blog stuff. Josh, you got a bunch of JavaScript stuff done. That blog, been... we've got a nice blog. I've, I was looking at that. I was showing Kaylin, actually, my wife, the blog, because she hadn't really looked at it. And uh, she was looking at like all our author avatars and, and everything. And yeah, I was like thinking about how much we've actually put into that blog, like money and just all the great people that have written for us. And it's pretty cool. It's working out well. It's nice to kind of just have it humming along and sort of make it more, just kind of making it, it work better, you know, continuously. One thing I want to work on next week is to, and I, I got started on it this week, which is to actually have our posts that are, like we have a ton, we have a huge backlog of posts that are written for us. And I would like to actually get those set up in a calendar where they're automatically published every oh, week. Yeah. because. I currently just like prepare one every week and publish it. And so if like something comes up, like, you know, people try and overthrow the government or anything like that, and I get distracted, <laughs> then we don't have a blog post that week, um, which <laughs> leaves people super bummed out, right? Because now there's yeah. two things wrong. The government's being overthrown <laughs> and they don't have a blog post. So yeah, so um, this week I started setting up, you know, making it so we could automatically publish blog posts. And I'm just like, I, I crashed up against the, sh the, the rocky shore a little bit of trying to get like scheduled actions running on GitHub. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I need to, I need to check and see if it ran last time it was supposed to. And hopefully it did. And if not, I will just try random crap over and over <laughs> again until it finally works. So yeah, wait, so how does the, how does the action actually work? Like, does it, um, does like, it prepare the article somehow, or does it like auto merge oh, no. the PRs or something? No, no. What it just does is, okay, I should back up and explain. So we use um, a static site generator for a blog, which is great in a lot of ways, but also makes certain things just like really bizarrely difficult. And one of these bizarrely difficult things is scheduled posts. So um, when we publish our blog to Netlify, our blog is built by Netlify and it's like, okay, which posts, you know, are published and those will be the ones that it, it displays, you know, from then on until we rebuild the blog. There's no built in way to periodically rebuild it or rebuild it, you know, based on when posts are supposed to go gotcha. out. Okay. Yeah. So essentially what, how this is going to work is, is we've got a job that's going to run on GitHub just cause that's convenient or was supposed to be convenient. It's going to run, you know, every day at midnight or 1am or whatever. And it's just going to, hit a webhook on Netlify and trigger the site to rebuild. And when it rebuilds, well, the well, middleman or static site generator, you can have posts scheduled in the future and it won't, gotcha. it won't publish okay. those. So, you know, if there is one that needs to be published, it'll just go ahead and, and build that one and, and not, not the other ones that are still in the future. Yeah. That's a cool way to do it. I didn't, hadn't thought of that. Uh, yeah. It's nice. Yeah, I mean, honestly, yeah. it's not nice. It's terrible. Well, it's like a really I mean, crappy. It's like, it's, why am I writing config files for yeah. GitHub just to publish a scheduled post on my freaking blog? In terms of like, like the, if you're going to have to build that though, like just <laughs> a single cron job that just hits like a webhook to rebuild it once a day is is probably about as simple as you could go. Oh right? yeah, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's nice that you could have you could have just put it in the cron tab actions. on your on your uh, personal computer, you know. <laughs> oh, I thought <laughs> on your about iMac. it. I thought about <laughs> it, but then I've got to make sure it's oh, it's running. I got to make sure it's open. Yeah. You know? 
Could have got you know. get a, like a little raspberry pie. <laughs> <laughs> That's my next stop. You're dedicated. That's my next stop. <laughs> Blog publishing. Yeah. You need to buy a mainframe. Learn COBOL. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. So we're switching to there WordPress then. <laughs> no, no. WordPress is, is, is even worse. Yeah. There's just no, there's no blog platform that is perfect, I guess. I don't know. Although I, don't, I really don't know why Netlify just doesn't let you say rebuild this every day. Like it's kind of. Yeah, that would be cool. Because. Yeah, there, there is a, a forum post where a bunch of people are asking for exactly that. Hmm. It just happened. Yeah, and they're just like, use Zapier. And it's like, I'm not going to pay Zapier to hit a webhook once a day. Yeah. Like, that's ridiculous. You could also I'll use... I'll pay GitHub to do that. Yeah, you could also <laughs> use... If, if GitHub won't cooperate, you could also use the last AWS, their events, the cloud events, that, because they have a scheduled event thing, and they could just trigger a Lambda, which could call the API. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. That might actually, we actually, that would probably be, we actually know, have a GitHub stable. repo for a bunch of cron jobs that run in Lambda. So what? Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're just over here, like living in, in Jetson's land and I'm, I'm living in Flint, Flintstone's <laughs> land. I used but the cron I, uh, recently too, the cron a- action on GitHub to automatically um, prepare a release for our, our JavaScript package once a week. So if there are yes. like unmerged, if there's like merge dependency updates and stuff, um, or if there are uh, change log additions, it uh, calculates like what the next version should be and then submits a pull request that I just merge and then it all gets released to NPM and everything. So fully oh, automated, really cool. which is like, that's been my dream for a few years now. So pretty stoked. Well, I'm glad got to working. have. I'm glad to have reports that it actually it's possible to get the cron working because um, yeah, well, I got yeah. it working one time. Like I think the I think the issue is, with it is like I think when you make changes to the file, like I there's something weird about like GitHub picking up those changes. Mm. Um, like it may not happen immediately, or maybe it takes a little while for it to you know update itself. And so meanwhile, I'm like. You know, I told it to run this thing every 10 minutes so I could test it. I uploaded it 20 minutes ago and it hasn't run. Maybe GitHub just has a a longer term outlook on life than I do. (laughs) It's really in Zen mode. Yeah, but it it will work eventually. Yeah. Josh, you did a blog post about our new JavaScript library. Yep. Universal Honey Badger JS and PM package is out and... Our documentation is updated. I think I got all of our, like, all the projects that were depending on the old Honey Badger JS NPM packages are updated and also new releases for them. I'm happy to have this project hopefully behind me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm sure there will be uh, some bug reports and stuff coming in, as there always are. But so yeah, far, it's been congrats. quiet. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, congrats on that. Yeah, it is. It is a large chunk of work, and I think it really like it's. It will set us up really nicely for the future. I think to have, like, I mean, like we're from a maintenance standpoint, like we only like we're going from two packages down to one, but also like there's a lot of overhead and like having to like duplicate code, and now the code is all shared, and only the environment specific parts are you know built in when you request it for like Node.js or for browser. Which means you can now also use it for like server side rendering environments where it's running on both the server and the client, which still just like kind of blows my mind a little bit that people do that, but there you go, like it works. So <laughs> it's a lot nicer now and it's, it's what, what you're expecting when you're, you know, when you want to do that. So pretty, pretty excited. Yeah, that's amazing. Like hopefully it will, yeah, be appealing to people doing more sort of JavaScript is like their main thing. It's hard to to stay excited about these projects when like I've literally been building the same thing over and over and over again for like eight years, <laughs> like these client libraries, like it's either like building new ones in different languages or like rebuilding them when like a language changes so much that you need to just like completely start, you know, start with something fresh. And after like the 10th, <laughs> after like the 10th rewrite, basically it's, you know, you're just on autopilot. So, but there were, there were some fun parts like it, I definitely learned a lot about JavaScript. I learned TypeScript. So I'm a TypeScript developer now. 
<laughs> oh, nice. Guess we should give you a raise. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, lots, lots of developers do um, cones, and your cone is just writing exception yes, notifiers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, Cobol. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'll let Star build the Cobol notifier. I mean, sure. Yeah. If there's a web, web framework for Cobol, now there's got to be a Honey Badger client, right? That's just a oh, of course, of course. I'll get right on that. <laughs> yeah. I'll well, we've right got that. Um, React Native is coming. That's our yes. our next focus. And then I really do want to like I say this, and then I, I'm like, oh yeah. Well, I'm now I want to like go all into mobile, like all the native platforms. So, but I'm uh, build it yet again. I'm not going to build it myself. I'm going to hire some genius developer to just like yeah whip it up yeah looking forward to that and next week we have our conclave it is oh yeah it's that time of the quarter we get to plan stuff i'm interested in seeing how it sort of pans out yeah a lot of a lot of exciting planning to do i think uh, our, our quarterly action plan is going to be full to the gills this time yeah yeah are, will we be coming up on like a year sin, of since our last like in person conclave? Like when when is that? Was it like I last? Think so, it was yeah. this quarter? Was because we skipped the one for Q two, right? So, yep. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's been so a while. Sad. Yeah, since I've I miss seen your smiling the, faces the bunker with y'all <laughs> across the table. That is I missed the bank vault. Yeah, yeah, we'll get back there eventually. And hopefully, in six months, we'll have vaccines and be able to, you know, have our in-person conclave for, mm -hmm. for what, like Q3, Q4? Yep. Yep. Here's well, to open. That would be awesome. You have been listening to Founder Quest. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever. And we're still looking, you know, we're always looking for authors. If you're interested in writing for us, we're especially looking for, for PHP authors and Ruby authors. And, you know, occasionally JavaScript author where I'm throwing JavaScript in there to see what happens. Go to our blog at honeybedger.io forward slash blog and look for the Write For Us page link at the top. And it's pretty easy. Just get in touch. Founder Quest is a weekly podcast by the founders of Honey Badger. Zero instrumentation, 360 degree coverage of errors, outages and service degradations for your web apps. If you have a web app, you need it. Available at honeybadger.io. Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word, where you can access our huge back catalog of episodes. FounderQuest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week. <laughs>